I'm going to start with a prayer for Ellicott City. And I firmly believe in the power of a Hail Mary. So that's where we're going today. Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is with you. Blessed art you among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And this is our Hail Mary for Ellicott City. I, I know I have friends who opted not to stay, and I saw the program this morning with the couple of the businesses who are not coming back. So um, it's very sad. Anyway, um, I'm going to introduce Tiffany Collinger, who is the... Um, program manager for Speakeasy Howard, which is the um, Horizon program that got us started on this journey two years ago. And she's going to give you, I hope, some updates and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Good up. Afternoon. Yes, it is afternoon, everyone. And thank you for coming. Uh, I know the weather is tough, but appreciate you making the time to come. I won't be before you long. I just wanted to connect the dots a little bit. Some of you had some paperwork that have Speakeasy Howard on it. You may be wondering what that phrase means, what that word means. Uh, Horizon Foundation is the county's local health philanthropy. We are the health foundation for Howard County. And one of the programs that we are supporting along with many of our community partners is this Speakeasy Howard campaign to encourage advanced care planning. So St. John the Evangelist has been an amazing partner in hosting this series and kind of taking this and running with it and creating the gift of peace ministry and offering uh, these programs to you. So today, I would like to introduce Byron McFarlane, who is the Register of Wills for Howard County, and we wanted to make sure that we were able to offer um, an estate planning session along with all those other different programs out there uh, because we know that there are questions related to this as well. So if you see the phrase Speakeasy Howard, just know it means planning for the future, thinking about those things kind of before the time comes, uh, and you'll be seeing more of that around the county. But with that, let me introduce Byron and let's welcome him up. All right, can everyone hear me all right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, um, I'd like to walk around a little bit, so I'm gonna, I don't feel pious enough to be up there. So um, <laughs> I, um, I wanna thank all of you for coming out and trudging here in the rain. I know the weather is terrible. Um, and I just wanna say thank you to Audrey for saying a prayer for um, Ellicott City. Um, our courthouse, uh, thankfully, is actually up uh, fairly highly elevated above Main Street. Um, so while we actually were, uh, while our building was not directly impacted, we did have uh, power outage for a day. Um, so the courthouse was closed for a day. Um, and part of the parking lot has been used as a staging area for all the emergency personnel. So um, we're certainly feeling the impacts of all of that. Um, and it really is sad. Um, so, um, again, I want to um, thank Audrey and Tiffany for the invitation to come and speak to all of you today. Um, my name is Byron McFarland. I'm the Register of Wills for Howard County. Um, usually when I give these presentations, um, I usually have two hours, so I'm going to condense it down to one, unless you all really want to hang out for a while. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on, typically when I give these presentations, I do, um, uh, I do a presentation every semester at Howard Community College. Um, so if any of you have friends or if you want to get a little bit more into the probate process, uh, the sort of like after people have passed side of this, um, can look that up. It's a free class. Um, and I usually do um, presentations at uh, the Bain Center and the other senior centers in the county um, pretty often. Um, but I'm going to focus today uh, predominantly on wills and sort of the planning side of, of what we deal with. Um, but just as a starting point, just to introduce myself, um, Byron McFarland, I'm a Howard County native, I grew up here, um, I actually live right down the road here in, um, in Columbia, but I grew up in western Howard County. Um, I got started uh, um, in local politics, I had a, actually a really great um, high school government teacher who really got me into government, 
Um, and so I started working at the county level, state level, I went to DC very briefly, found that I really didn't like working there. Uh, so I came back to Maryland, um, uh, local government and state government. I just, we're so much closer to people um, and that's what I like about it. We can have a real impact on people's lives. And I've held, had this position since 2010. Um, it is an elected position. Uh, it's one of those courthouse offices that, that's at the bottom of the ballot with the sheriff and the state's attorney that, that we, I don't really even have to explain to a voter like why I should have the job. I just explain, like they're, they're never gonna meet another candidate, so. Uh, but anyway, um, I was actually out, I was door knocking with a candidate for state's attorney yesterday in Ellicott City. Uh, and it was the first time we talked to a voter who had a very specific question about sentencing and a very specific question about wills. And thankfully we were both there to answer them. Um, uh, while the position to register wills is not required to be a lawyer, I am an, an attorney. Um, so I'm a member of the Howard County Bar Association, the Maryland Bar Association. Um, and there's a register of wills for every county in Baltimore City, so there are 24 of us. There's one in every jurisdiction. As I talk about wills, everything that I'm talking about and in your materials, it may have my name and phone number on it. Um, we follow Maryland law, so procedurally there are some things we might do differently county by county, but the law is the same throughout Maryland, okay? Um, I served as president of this association for three years, so um, we worked on a lot of issues together. Um, and again, I, I love giving these presentations all over the county, um, uh, and I had the opportunity actually to teach law school for a couple semesters at Howard, um, at Howard Law School. Um, getting up and talking for two hours at a time, twice a week for four months was an adventure. Um, Okay, so, and let me just say also, um, feel free to interrupt me at any time. If you have a question, just raise your hand. Um, I could stand up here and talk about this stuff all day, so feel free to interrupt at any time. So I'm gonna start with um, really basic questions. So what is a will? Um, I don't know what, what topics you've covered in some of the other, your other talks, but I'm gonna focus predominantly on the last will and testament today. There are other estate planning, uh, future planning tools that you have, advanced directive, power of attorney, irrevocable trust, if that's something that might be beneficial to you. Um, what I deal with are just wills. So when you, if you already have some of those documents put together or you're thinking about doing it, um, we do not deal with trusts, we do not deal with powers of attorney, and we don't deal with advanced directives. And advanced directives, it's important to keep in mind, advanced directives and powers of attorney are only in effect until someone passes away. Um, and we get people who call us all the time and say, um, my mom died, I'm her power of attorney, and I need, to do, I need to pay some bills. You are no longer the power of attorney after someone's passed, and we just try to um, make sure that people don't get themselves in any kind of trouble. Um, as soon as someone's passed, the power of attorney is extinguished. Advanced directive obviously doesn't apply anymore. For you to conduct business on behalf of the person who's passed away, you'll need to open an estate, okay? and I'll explain what that means shortly. But a will really is one of the most important documents you can have. Um, it, it is everything that you want to have carried out after you've passed away. And a will, it's important to note too, it's not effective. The language in the will is not effective. It's just a piece of paper until it's been admitted to probate. And what that means is that someone has brought it to the Register of Wills in Maryland. Um, it's sort of a unique institution that we have. Um, most states, um, the circuit court, so when you think of jury duty, you think of um, divorces, stuff like that, the circuit court deals with. In most states, like Virginia, for example, there is a probate division of their circuit court. Maryland, Delaware, and Pennsylvania are the only, and Washington, D.C., actually, we're the only four jurisdictions in America that has this office, the Register of Wills. What's nice about it, though, for all of you as Maryland residents is that we're sort of like a specialty court. This is all we deal with, okay? so. You know, if, if someone passed away in Virginia, you know, there may be a probate matter before a judge, right before a criminal trial that comes after a divorce hearing. Um, this is all we do. So for me and my deputies, um, we get to sort of really hone our expertise on how to handle these issues. Um, okay. Uh, there are three statutory requirements for a will in Maryland. It has to be in writing signed by the testator, testator is the legal term for the person whose will it is, and it has to be attested and signed by at least two credible witnesses. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, two credible witnesses. Basically in Maryland, all that means is that they are adults. 
Your witnesses can be any two adults. We do not require in Maryland that your will be notarized. Some states require that. New York, for example, requires a notary. Maryland doesn't. You can use notaries as one or either of your witnesses if you'd like. Um, people who inherit in the will can be uh, witnesses. Um, and these requirements vary a little bit from state to state, okay? So if any of you plan on moving, one thing that you should know, or if you've recently moved here from somewhere else and you have a will from another state, every state in America has a law that says that we will recognize a will that was validly executed in another state. So if you used to live in New York and you went to a New York lawyer and you had your will drawn up in New York and you executed it in New York and it was valid there, if you bring it here, it will be valid here as well. Um, and I don't know what percentage, but we get pretty often, I would say, people um, bringing in wills that are not from Maryland. So that's important to know, but the witness requirements usually change a little bit from state to state. So like in Pennsylvania, um, the witnesses have to be disinterested, so they can't inherit in the will. But in Maryland, it can be any two people. What I usually suggest to folks is that you, you consider having witnesses who might make good witnesses on a stand. So in the event that the will is ever challenged, they would make good witnesses. So um, I know years ago when I, um, uh, my, gran my grandmother passed away in 2012, um, but before, a couple of years before that, she had a, you know, I wrote a will for her, and, um, and I think that she probably got friends. She lived at Charlestown in Catonsville, and she had, I think, a couple of other residents sign, you know. Uh, probably would have been better to have, like, my brother and I sign, or someone who, again, you know, might hold up well when they're being, you know, um, cross-examined by a hostile attorney, okay? Um, we don't get a whole lot of will challenges, but when we do, sometimes the witnesses have to come in and they have to testify. Um, and let me just uh, uh, give you all an idea of what that's like because we, um, you know, this whole subject, you know, estate planning, wills, what happens after someone's passed away, what happens to their stuff, the will itself. We see a lot of this, we hear a lot of this in movies and TV. Um, and um, I'll make a couple of quick notes. Uh, video wills are not valid, so you see that in, in culture sometimes that people have like the dramatic, you know, video will, those are not valid. It has to be in writing. Um, we also don't do any kind of verbal wills, um, so, you know, it can be frustrating, I know, for folks sometimes because they'll, they'll say, well, I was supposed to, my mom told me I was going to get the grandfather clock or whatever it was, and it's not in the will. It's not in writing, you're not going to, you know, it's not going to be valid. And you can imagine, you know, what the probate process, what the sort of post-death process would be like if we relied on hearsay. Um, so it's really, it has to be in writing. Um, and when it comes to um, will challenges, most of the time what we see are um, people who are not represented by counsel. So we have people who come into our office pro se and they want to challenge a will. Um, I'd say 49 times out of 50, it, it's usually someone who did not get what they wanted in the will. Um, and they make sort of a blanket sort of, um, they make sort of blanket accusations without any kind of supporting evidence that the decedent lacked mental capacity to make their will. Um, something that I found important um, over time is to really, um, you know, I go to these conferences and we talk about probate and wills, but I also find um, educating ourselves about mental health, especially for older folks, is um, it's really important. Um, because when someone says, and we get this all the time, again, it's, you know, my dad, my dad had dementia, so he couldn't possibly have known what he was doing. Not true at all, uh, right? I mean, th this is an illness that there's a whole spectrum. You can have, you know, you can have someone who has perhaps been diagnosed as having dementia or Alzheimer's, and they've got 364 days a year that are good, and only one bad day a year, um, or the opposite. The law, uh, as far as you having the capacity to make a will, um, you, you're presumed to have that capacity as an adult unless at the, really at the specific time of the signing of the will, you didn't have capacity, okay? So you could actually have had someone who was having a bad morning and had a bad night, but the middle of the day they were fine and the will will be valid. The only way that you can overcome, you know, when you think about when you sign deeds and contracts and everything, you know, we have strong legal presumptions that if you sign something, you had the capacity to know what you were doing, and that is your signature. 
And again, there's lots of reasons for, for why that is. Um, so uh, to overcome that someone had the capacity, you would probably have to have a couple of doctors testify and you'd probably need a mountain of documentary evidence. In my almost eight years as a Register of Wills in Howard County, we've only had two wills thrown out and they were forgeries. So it wasn't because there was a lack of capacity, it was because family members decided that they were gonna create their own will. Um, and um, uh, one was a uh, legal Zoom will, um, and you know, I'm sure one of you may ask a question, so I'm just gonna an answer it preemptively. Um, are internet wills valid? As long as it has those, meets those three requirements, it'll be a valid will, okay? So if you go into LegalZoom or uh, I know there are a bunch of different services, those will be valid um, as long as they have those three requirements met. I mean, you could actually take like a, um, a napkin and write your last wishes on it. And if it's signed, you know, it doesn't have to be typed. We get handwritten wills sometimes. Um, so as long as it meets those requirements, it'll be valid. Um, but the one that we had thrown out was a, was a LegalZoom will. Um, and the woman, um, she wanted to disinherit. It was, it was, um, she was the second spouse, and there were children from the first marriage, um, and she wanted to disinherit them. Um, and um, she sort of, uh, sort of clumsily admitted in court that it was a forgery. Um, the other one was a really frustrating and sad case. Actually, it was here in Wild Lake. A woman passed away, um, and a relative came in. Um, her husband had predeceased her, no children. Um, a relative appeared uh, visiting from New York and had this will. Um, and when I was teaching, when I teach my law students, I give them a copy of this will because it is, uh, it, it, it was like 15 pages long and it looked like it was copied and pasted versions of like 20 different wills that this person found online. Um, and um, shamefully, there was, this was a woman and her husband who were both ministers and they had written this will to leave everything to them and their church. Um, we actually brought the two of them in sequestered them, so we questioned the, they were, they were the, the husband and wife were the two witnesses of the will, so we actually questioned them separately about the circumstances surrounding the execution of the will. Lo and behold, they give different stories. Um, and um, so when we brought them back together and told them, this is what you said, this is what you said, um, and you could see the husband sort of like shrank in his chair knowing he had done something horrible, and that's the point where the wife stood up and she said, I took care of her, I deserve this, this, was my, this is my money, um, we eventually appointed an attorney to take care of the estate. Uh, the woman who passed away was a hoarder. Um, they cleaned out the whole house, but amazingly enough, found an actual will that left everything to another relative in Georgia. Um, so everything, justice was done in that case. Um, but just to point out, um, you know, we get those challenges every now and then. Um, so if you're gonna choose witnesses, you might wanna cho choose people who might make good um, witnesses on the stand. Yes. Are you talking about like a, ho like a hospital policy? Well, hospital policy, you can't give consent if you are on narcotics if they presume that you don't have the capacity. What about, because I had a patient whose family contacted the bill and yeah. pulled in all of our medical records. And, um, but if they're on, is there something that you can read the law recognizes that? Uh, again, there's a presumption that you have capacity and someone has to prove that you didn't. And just because you're on some sort of narcotic doesn't mean that you don't have capacity. Okay. okay. Um, and we do sometimes have challenges over deathbed wills, um, but you know sometimes people they're near the end, but they're perfectly lucid and they know what they're doing. Um, so again, that's the presumption that we're going to have until someone disproves it. I mean, they have to prove that it can't just be well he was on, you know, um, uh, morphine. A uh, good example. Um, you know, he, and this is how much was administered, he didn't have capacity. You're gonna have to have someone who actually was observing that person at the time, okay? So again, it's, it's just, it's difficult. Um, yes? I mean, I would pick family members, people that you trust. Um, and again, they can be people who are, um, 
And, and you can have more than two witnesses if you want also. Um, I know some attorneys actually do three or four witnesses. So that's another alternative. Are there any questions? Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. That, that was my question. Would registering your will help with someone? Would registering you your will uh, help with someone trying to file a fraud fraudulent will? Yeah. So one of the services that, um, so the question is, does it help to register your will? Um, one of the, um, one of the, uh, services that my office provides is that you can file your will for safekeeping while you're alive. It's a confidential service, it's only $5. Um, we store wills in their fireproof locked uh, cabinets in the back of the courthouse that only I and my staff have access to. Um, filing with us would prevent any tampering with it if you kept it at home um, or if you left it in a safe deposit box. Um, every now and then people will leave their will on file with, like, with their attorney attorney retires, moves out of state or something, and, it, and they can't find it. Um, when someone passes away and someone, some family member comes to our office, the very first thing that we do is check to see if there's a will on file. Um, so sometimes people come in and they don't know that mom had a will, and we, we have it for her. Um, so it's, it's, I, I, would, I would characterize it as a, a safeguard for you. So, um, and we deal with issues. I mean, this is a good question. I mean, once you have your, as I mentioned, you know, we don't keep trusts or advanced directives or powers of attorney on file. Um, we do keep wills. Um, and the alternatives to filing with us are um, keeping a safe deposit box. Um, if you do that, my suggestion would be um, to make sure that someone else that you trust is on the account, on the box, or at least has a key. Um, because if neither of those things are the case, we have to get a court order. Um, and I actually have to go to the bank. Like we've got to deal with the bank's legal department, which is never here. Um, so we have to go to the deal with the, the bank and drill the box and everything. Um, and we, that's an expense of the estate we'd like to avoid. So, um, and I think of all the times I've done it, I'd say half the time there's no. Actually, most of the time there's no will. Um, so, and sometimes the last time I did this, the person's advance directive and power of attorney were in there. That is the last place they should be, right? I mean, you need to have access to those, you know, while you're living. Um, and a couple times we found, um, I went to the Bank of America in Clarksville once, and it was one of those big boxes, and it was full of coins. It was like $50,000 worth of rare coins. Um, so, but in any event, that's the safe deposit box. Um, and again, you can keep it at home, but, um, but again, it's only $5 to file with us. I think that it, if you, talk to Howard County attorneys or if you consult with an attorney here and they do that for you, most of them just sort of as a matter of practice file it with us. So, yes. It can transfer from state to state, but for example, if the will was written in Montgomery County, can that, and the person moved to Howard County, does it have to be opened in uh, Montgomery County? If no, it was I mean, not a registered will? No, you're, if you have a, a will, where, wherever your will is executed, it will be valid anywhere else, okay? So your New York will is valid in Maryland, your Montgomery County will is valid in Howard County, okay? So there's no, as long as it was validly executed wherever you had it written, it will be valid anywhere in America, okay? Um, now, if you move from county to county, like if you live in Montgomery County, you file your will for safekeeping there, and you move to Howard County, um, we're, we're very flexible about that. You can either come in and pick it up or we'll, we'll mail it to you and then you can file it there, okay? Same thing if you move out of state. Um, and we've lost our, there we go, okay. Um, okay, so any other questions about wills right now? Okay, that's a good question. Um, are copies of wills valid? In Maryland, uh, yes they are. There is an additional hurdle, though. Um, Maryland law requires that the copy, you've got to get consent from everyone named in the will and everyone who would inherit if there is no will. They all have to consent to that, and a court has to sign off on it. So there's an extra hurdle. You know, we see it not infrequently, um, but 
it's, it'll be easier for your family if they have the original, but a, a copy will be valid. You're talking about a, a copy of a completed will? Saying could um, copies of completed will, but signed individually. Then you'll have multiple original wills. Right. Yeah. So it will be okay to. Yeah. You can do that. I mean, um, the one thing I'll say is that if you ever want to change your will or you want to execute a new will, my advice is to go and, and physically destroy the original, your, the, your, pre, your prior original and every copy of it. Um, and the reason for that is that, you know, we're going to use the more recent will. Um, you know, most wills have sort of boilerplate language that says something like, you know, I, John Smith, being of sound dis disposing mind, uh, revoking all uh, prior wills made, yada, yada, yada. Um, but I would still go back and I would destroy every copy of it. And occasionally we do have um, issues where, you know, someone passes away, they have a, let's just say they have a 2018 will, and they have a um, son or relative maybe that they weren't as close with as others who has been holding on to a copy of an old one for forever, biding their time or whatever. Um, just knowing that, or expecting that they were going to be getting something, and they come in and they have, you know, this is my mom's will from 1997, and I'm supposed to get this, and where is it? Um, you know, so you, whatever decisions that you make about your estate planning is entirely your own, um, and you don't have to share it with anyone. I do sort of say to folks, um, avoiding surprises for family members at that time is a good thing. Um, We've all lost loved ones. When, when things, when you compound all the emotions you're going through, that can be extreme sadness, all the way and anger, and all and everything in between. Um, you compound that with, I was supposed to get something and I'm not getting it. Um, it can create some serious problems. Um, we had a, a case. I think it's finally closed. Um, there were two daughters. One was living with mom. Um, she took care of mom, took her to her doctor's appointments, fed her everything. When mom died, she thought the house was going to be hers. I took care of my mom. This is my house, right? Um, pro many years, actually, prior to her passing, her mother had executed what's called a life estate deed. A life estate deed is almost, think of a house with uh, like a beneficiary designation on it. So as soon as um, mom passed, the house was immediately split between the two kids. So this estate, there actually really wasn't a whole lot of money in the estate, um, but it dragged out for um, many months, and I would probably say over $10,000 in lawyer's fees fighting over um, furniture and stuff like that. And it was because of this, you know, um, unexpected circumstance for the one, uh, the one daughter. Yes, ma'am? Um, the question is, when should you update a will? Um, I usually suggest updating a will or doing an entirely new will when you've had major life changes. So depending on, if you've moved to a state that has very different probate laws, that might be a good time to, to do it. Getting married or getting divorced, especially getting divorced, you'd be surprised at how many people we have, they've passed away, they never updated their will from their divorce, um, and it creates huge problems. Um, so I would say, again, uh, maybe if, if there's a, um, a dramatic change in your financial picture, um, you've had children, so I would say big life events. If it's something like um, you have one new asset that you want to do something with, or let's just say you, you, bought it, you buy a vacation home or something like that, um, or an investment property, um, or you have some sort of tangible personal item that you want something specific to be done with, um, or you want to add a new beneficiary, or you want to um, change who you name as your executor, those are all things you can do with what's called a codicil. That's C-O-D-I-C-I-L. And that's an amendment to a will, essentially. Um, and it has the same three requirements. So it has to be in writing, signed with two witnesses. Do not, after you have a will executed, decide that you want to make changes and just make notes on your will. Um, those are not going to be valid. Um, and again, it's going to lead to confusion and problems for whoever is, um, whoever is b left behind. 
um, if you want to make changes, or you can make changes on your will, but just again, make sure that it's clear, it's in writing, that you sign it, and that there are witness signatures also. Um, so again, major life events for a new will, I'd say, um, minor things you can do with a codicil. And those you can also file with us. So every now and then we have people who we have a will and file, they'll come in a few years later, maybe they had uh, another grandchild born or something and they wanna um, execute a codicil so they can file that with us also. And you can execute as many as you want. We've seen, I think, three or four codicils to a will before. Um, and you know, what I drew, and I'm and kind of coming back to the, um, this series that you're doing, you know, the way that I try to talk to people about, just try to encourage them to talk to a lawyer, have a will drawn up, sign it, you know, and make it official. Um, for me, it's peace of mind. It really is. And for me, you know, I'm 35, I'm healthy, but I'm not married, I don't have any children. So if something happens to me, I want to make sure that my parents and my siblings know what to do. Um, so I have a will, and everything is laid out very clearly um, so that they don't have to, you know, that there are question marks that are not going to be there for them. You know, they know who's going to be the executor. They know where all my money's going to my student loans, so that there's not going to be anything left. Um, but um, but uh, that's, that's the simplest, easiest way that I can, uh, I can share it with you, is I just, it, it really does give you peace of mind. Um, and especially for people who have, I have a lot of friends who have children, um, one of the things that you can do with a will also is to name a guardian for minor children. You know, t for the most part, my office handles the probate process, so your assets after you've passed away. The, I work with the orphans court, and I'll explain what they do shortly. One of the things they do is appoint guardians for minor children, um, and guardians for property of minor children. Um, so if someone dies, they leave um, a savings account for a 10-year-old. Um, we will appoint someone to basically to um, hold on to that asset um, until the, the child reaches 18. Um, so if you've got anyone who has minor children, you can name guardian, you can name a guardian or guardians in, uh, in your will. Again, it, it removes a question mark at a really difficult time for people. So um, with that, I'll move on to, um, yeah. Just, if you just have a will, like say this would be my example, I have three children, but one of them is not married and um, two of them have, you know, I have grandchildren with the other two. So um, if like most things say life insurance, it will say either go to the surviving spouse or divided equally among your children. Say so God forbid one of my children died, the one that had grandchildren for me. Would the money then be divided between the two remaining children, adult children I have, and nothing go to, say, the one who died's children? That's my understanding, and I just wanted to be clear. Yeah. So, That's true. Um, in, in your will, you, mm -hmm. can, you can decide that, essentially. Okay. You can, you can decide, you know, typically, uh, one of the great benefits of, of having a will is sort of contingency planning. Okay. So you can have sort of a... Um, you know, I name this person as my personal representative. That's the term we use for executor in Maryland. Um, and if that person is un unable, unable to serve, then I appoint so-and-so. If that person can't serve, then I serve. And the same thing with who's going to inherit. You know, if any, you could say, you know, um, and if my, um, and if, you know, my son, John, should predecease me, then his share shall be divided among his surviving children, something like that. Um, and you can, there are all kinds of legal terms of art that can be used to be very specific. I mean, maybe you want to use children, maybe you want to use issue, which would include stepchildren. Um, so um, in any event, that's, again, the beauty part of it is that you can plan for all of that. Um, was that per, well, <clears throat> um, we hear, um, you know, again, there's a lot of this that is put out there in, uh, in the press and commentators talk about like the beauty, the wonder of revocable trust, that it's like this sort of cure-all that will prevent you from ever having to pay taxes again and you can avoid probate and yada, yada, yada. Um, there are benefits to trust and it really is a case-by-case -case situation whether it is right for you. And what I'll say is that there are parts of the country where the probate process, which I'm, I'm about to describe, is really horrible. Um, it's expensive, it's extremely time-consuming. You are dealing with personnel 
who don't know what they're doing. And Florida is, is always my, it's a great place to travel to. Um, people always talk about Florida as being, you know, they don't have estate taxes and they don't have retirement income taxes and everything. Well, when it comes to this process, Maryland has made a decision to make sure that our, the registers of wills and the support that we get from the state, we are, um, we're actually funded by inheritance taxes, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, so we are well staffed. You know, we have people who are professionals who work there every day and can answer these questions. In Florida, good luck. Um, if, the, if the estate is over a certain amount, the law requires you to hire a lawyer. Um, most, of, most of the states we deal with, you don't need a lawyer because it's simple enough and my staff, we are not able to give legal advice, but we come as close to that as we can. Um, but again, Florida, you're gonna get you know, part-time people, they're not gonna answer the phones. It's, you know, I, as you might imagine, I deal with lots of lawyers who are licensed here in Maryland and Florida. Um, and they describe the process as being a really a nightmare. Um, so when people talk about you should get a trust because it'll avoid probate, in some parts of the country, it's worth it. Here, I, I, you know, I, I deal with people who do what I do all over the country. I think we have the best system in the, in the country. Our fees are low, um, the system is simple, um, and whether you're here or Garrett County or Baltimore City or wherever, I think myself and my colleagues really make this fairly easy for folks. So. Um, there are financial considerations that are, um, I, I don't have the expertise to talk about, but um, it might be right for you. Trusts, you know, creating a trust is a lot more expensive than creating a will. Um, you know, some attorneys will charge somewhere between, I don't know, 500 to 1500 for a will or something. Trust can be several thousand. Um, you know, trusts have annual maintenance costs. You've got to pay a trustee, you've got to pay a fiduciary, someone to do the fiduciary tax return. If they're investing money, you're gonna have to pay someone to do that. Whereas the will, um, as you can imagine, the lifetime of an estate is usually pretty short. It's usually six months or less, um, depending on the value of the estate. So um, that's my quick little you know, issue on, um, on trust. Um, it really is a case by case basis. And, and we hear, I, I see this all the time, and it's really sad when people have spent a lot of money on trust What's important to avoid probate and to get the financial benefits and everything, once the trust is created, the, you have to transfer your assets into the trust. You have to retitle your assets into the trust. And you know, we see all the time, the, you know, someone got paid to create the trust, um, but before the person died, they never took the time to transfer all their assets. So they basically had an empty trust that was just money thrown down. Yeah, you know, so, um, so anyway, again, it's a case by case, it really is a case by case situation. Okay, so what is an estate? <clears throat> so, and we're, when we're talking about probate and estate administration, so this is after someone's passed away, what is their estate? Um, and I put these pictures up. <clears throat> Some of you may recognize the picture on the lower right. Does anyone know what that is? It's Joe Reagan Manor, so the, the Charles Carroll property here in Ellicott City. Um, which sadly is um, off limits to the public, but um, in any event. So some people think when we talk about estates, we're talking about a lot of money or a lot of land. Um, in, when we're talking about probate, an estate can be anything. I, I have dealt with estates under $100 and over $25 million. What your estate is comprised of is, uh, and there's a lot of text here, focus on the bottom portion, your probate estate is assets that are in your own name alone or don't have a beneficiary. And that, it's those assets that are governed by your will, okay? Um, so anything that is jointly titled, anything that has a beneficiary on it, those all pass outside of probate, okay? So if you own your house with a spouse as tenants by the entireties or with a sibling or whoever else as joint tenants, that passes outside of probate joint bank accounts, uh, retirement accounts, or life insurance policies that have beneficiaries on them. None of that comes through probate, okay? So um, if you kind of think in your, in your own lives what all your assets are, um, it's actually pretty easy to avoid all of this uh, if you really want to. If you have beneficiaries and everything, you know, sometimes it's tricky. Maybe you don't, you don't want someone to have access to your bank accounts, or maybe you know, property is a little complicated. Um, but um, for, especially for financial accounts, it can be pretty easy, though, to um, to um, you know, 
designated beneficiary or a payable on death or transfer on death beneficiary um, and remove those assets from what would be the probate process. I do usually say um, when you do that, just be very mindful. Um, you know, so if you want to go to your bank and you've got a savings account or a mutual fund or whatever and you want to name beneficiaries, we're talking about contingency planning. Um, make sure that you're very specific with whoever you talk to about what you want to have happen. So if you want, you know, when you pass away, your um, investment account to be split 50-50 between two kids, make sure that that's what they put in writing. Um, because um, these days, these, diff these different kinds of financial instruments, they're changing every day. Um, you can do certain things with some accounts and you can't with others. Um, and I just give this one example. Um, uh, you know, I have a will, but I have everything taken care of, so I, I won't have a probate estate when I pass away. Um, if, our, if that were to happen now. Um, but I, I think my like, checking and savings account, I didn't have beneficiaries on. And I was like, I need to take care of this. Like, this is what I do for a living. I should probably have this squared away. Um, and so I went to the bank. Um, of course, I got someone who, you know when you walk in someplace and you just get that feeling right off the bat that they don't know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, I got that feeling. Um, and so sat down with him um, and I said very specifically, I said, I want, you know, my mother is my primary beneficiary, and I want my brother as my contingent beneficiary. Fast forward 20 minutes, he's printed out all these forms, I've given him social security numbers and everything. Um, I sign all this stuff, um, or I'm about to sign all this stuff, and I was looking at this piece of paper that he put in front of me, and it was like a grid. It was like, it was like six boxes and my account information at the top. And I didn't see the word primary or contingent or secondary or anything anywhere. And I said to him, you know, when I'm looking at this, it looks like if something were to happen to me, my mom and my brother would split my accounts 50-50. And like, that's what this says. It's not to one than the other. Um, fast forward another half an hour, the bank manager has finally told me that I can't do that on that type of account. I can't have a contingent beneficiary. I can only have a primary. So I said, okay, well, I want to remove my brother and just have my mom on there. Um, but that was an hour. And I only caught it because this is what I do for a living. So for each of you, um, again, just be very uh, careful about that because you want to make sure the right thing happens when something happens to you, okay? Um, one of the things, I'm, I'll make this comment real quick. Um, one of the things that we, we open a lot of estates for just a car. Um, the Maryland legislature has just changed the law on that, though. Um, there are two different, there are two changes I think that you should be aware of. One is that you can actually put a beneficiary designation on your car. Um, so you can actually, uh, I think you can go online now and you can actually put that information into the MBA website and they will print out, it'll actually be on your title. Um, so it's basically a beneficiary or transfer on death designation on your car. Um, that way you can, give your car to someone without having to make them a joint account holder or joint title, um, have joint title with them, which would make them have to get insurance. Um, so that's, that's one way that you can take care of a car. Um, the other thing is that um, they just changed the law so that if uh, the spouse is the sole heir, so someone passed away and their spouse is the sole heir, you can just take the title to the car um, to the MBA and transfer it. So, um, so hopefully we'll have fewer estates where we're just, you know, processing people to send them over to the MBA and deal with that. Um, so just a couple of things for you to be aware of for cars. Okay, um, if someone passes away, so as we're talking about the, your probate estate, lots of people pass away and they have a will, but they've planned well enough that they don't actually have any probate assets. So. The situation would be, you know, my mom died, my husband died, um, and there is no probate estate, but we have a will. What do I do with it? Just file it with us, um, and you can mail it to us or you can come into the office. Um, what we do is we open what's called a will of no estate. There is no fee, it's just a two page, I think I've got a, that's what the form looks like. We will actually fill that in for you, and you sign it, and that's it. Um, the reason we do that is um, in the event you do discover some sort of asset down the road. And if you do, we wanna make sure that the person's wishes were followed. And it does happen every now and then. Um, a couple years ago, a woman had passed away and it was, it was, I think at least five years later, the family found 
it was, uh, it was like a couple hundred stock certificates that she had stuffed in a drawer somewhere that they had never realized were there. So again, the benefit is that the will had been filed with us, so um, we were able to make sure that um, her wishes were followed. And just to use some, some local examples, so when James Rouse and Patty Rouse, when the, when the two of them passed away, they had trusts. Um, they had wills um, as a safeguard, but everything was in trust, so uh, when they passed away, they just filed the will, and that was it. That's sort of, I guess, best case scenario when you're, when you're thinking about planning. <clears throat> okay, so um, probate, estate administration, they're um, interchangeable terms. Probate, I think, has, gives people a worse reaction, but it's shorter. Um, but it basically the probate process is, it's basically um, marshalling all the assets of the decedent, figuring out whatever debts there may have been, paying off those debts, and then making distribution uh, under the terms of the will if there were one, and if not, um, uh, Maryland law basically writes a will for you if you don't have one that decides where your assets go. Um, and it's sort of, I think that, I don't know if you, if you have a family tree in your materials. Um, I think you do, or you might. Um, see that real quick if there's one. Mm -hmm. Okay, looks like it isn't. Um, if you can just think of um, when someone passes away without a will, um, it sort of follows sort of uh, intuitively spouse inherits, then children, um, then parents, then siblings. So you sort of look at, you sort of look at um, the spouse and kids, and then you sort of look up the family tree to your parents. And if there are no parents, then you sort of go down the family tree to siblings, nieces, and nephews. Um, so if you don't have a will, um, instead of making distribution, obviously, under the terms of a will, um, you just follow uh, what Maryland law says. So again, one of the great benefits of having a will is that you don't, you're not gonna rely on um, whatever the law is at the time that you pass away because the legislature has been, um, Maryland's probate law is very old. Um, old in the sense of being antiquated, I think. Um, so like our law doesn't, um, in a lot of states they make sort of allowances and they envision uh, a broader array of family dynamics, I'll put it that way. So when you have, in most states, they would, um, distribution would be different if you have like a spouse and children um, and all of the children that you and your spouse have are children that you had together. You didn't have any other children. Um, the spouse would get everything. Not in Maryland. In Maryland, the spouse would get most of it, but some would pass to the children as well. So some of it's sort of counterintuitive. Um, and so, um, you can avoid all of that, and again, they change the law every year, so um, you can avoid all of that by having a will. Yes? Do you, um, has the Maryland law recognized children and grandchildren that are surrogates? Yes. Um, we treat, um, yeah, we treat children who are, um, Children who are born from a surrogate, um, adopted children, um, they're all treated the same um, under Maryland law. Um, okay. One of the things we try to always um, uh, uh, stress with folks, if you look at this list, this is copied uh, verbatim from Maryland law, and this is basically the order of payment. This is what has to be paid out before, so someone passes away and a state is opened, um, notice is printed in the paper. Um, these are the things that have to be paid out before anyone is given distribution, so before your heirs actually inherit anything. Excuse me. Um, so it's uh, fees to my office, um, if there are any costs of uh, administration, uh, funeral expenses. Um, one of the benefits of um, having a will is that if you plan to, if you're, if you might have family pay funeral expenses out of pocket, um, I know lots of people do advanced planning for that, but if not, 
um, the, you can allow your estate to pay out any amount of money for your funeral. Maryland has a $15,000 statutory allowance, and what that means is that um, if someone is trying to get reimbursed from your estate for paying for the funeral, you get up to $15,000, basically no questions asked. If it goes above that, a court has to approve it. So if you do not want the local orphans court deciding whether you know, whatever was purchased for your funeral was um, appropriate, and that, uh, I've seen that happen before, where judges are, are um, not happy with, uh, I think there was, a, there was a case in Carroll County a few years ago where the, the decedent in his will specified a very expensive brand of scotch to be served at his wake. Um, and the court didn't like that, and they didn't want to approve it. So if you want to avoid all of that, um, you can just have a, uh, and this is boilerplate language that you'd find in any will, um, a funeral allowance provision that allows your estate to pay whatever, basically the personal representative of your estate to pay whatever they think is appropriate. So if you trust this person, obviously you can, you can do that. For larger estates, that individual, the PR, um, is entitled to compensation. Um, Oftentimes they don't take them because they're taxable as income. Um, and if it's someone who's inheriting, like, a, um, like if it's a child who wouldn't pay any taxes on that otherwise, um, they may not take those commissions. Um, family allowance, um, any taxes um, or um, other claims against the estate. Something that people do too is um, you can file claims against probate estates in my office. Um, so they're usually, we usually get like medical expenses and like, um, debt collection companies send us claims. So um, while that list looks kind of daunting, most estates only have maybe two or three of those. So every estate's gonna pay a small fee, um, but if like the funeral is prepaid and it was a relatively small estate and there were no debts, then you can just move forward with um, making distribution to whoever is supposed to inherit. If, um, if someone passes away without a will and they have no relatives, um, in Maryland we look all the way out. If you can think of your great-grandparents and the descendants of your great-grandparents, I, I would be very impressed if any of you knew all of those people um, because they're, they're, you're, we're talking about fairly distant relatives here, but that's how far we look to try to find some living blood relative before the estate um, is given to the local school board. That's the law in Maryland. So we look, for, we look very far for family members before the Board of Ed um, receives the estate. So again, those are only estates where um, there is no will and there is no blood relative out to the descendants of your great-grandparents. And that happens in Howard County about um, once every other year. Okay, so back to <clears throat> the Register of Wills in the Orphan's Court. So as I said, um, there's one in every county. We have, our, our procedures might be a little different from county to county, um, but if you walk into my office or you go to Montgomery County, we use the same computers, the same software, um, and we are, um, we're not actually a county office, we're a state agency, um, and we work with the comptroller, um, and that's because we collect inheritance taxes which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. I like to just put up a picture of my office just so you know what it looks like. It's right when you walk into the courthouse. Um, we are eagerly awaiting the construction of the new courthouse in a couple of years um, because we are out of space. Um, we also have, um, so the legislature made a decision years ago to um, basically take the probate process away from orphans courts and give it to registers of wills. So, in the overwhelming majority of the states, you will never have to go before a judge in Maryland. Um, you will deal with me and my deputies and that's it. Um, the Orphan's Court has remained to deal with disputes essentially. And it's a panel of judges, it's three judges in Howard County and in most counties. They're not required to be lawyers. Um, and uh, they handle, um, so if there are disputes over who's gonna be appointed as the personal representative, um, if there are challenges to the will, if someone wants to try to interpret the will, um, we have lots of disputes over um, accounting. So like we get people who will, they'll want a hearing because they think that assets aren't being included in the estate, so someone's hiding something. 
um, or there are complaints about um, what's being spent out of the estate. <clears throat> um, what's really bizarre is that the actual will challenges, like if someone wants to say, my dad didn't have capacity, I want the will thrown out, those cases all go to the circuit court. The orphan's court um, doesn't actually hear them. And that's our little courtroom. So when, you, um, when people call the office and they say they've lost a loved one, this, these are the three questions we ask them. One, was the person domiciled in Howard County? Um, and typically that's not a difficult question to answer. It's where you went to bed every night, where you got your mail, where you're um, registered to vote. Um, every now and then though we help people who like lived their entire lifetime in Baltimore City and they were at hospice here for a week and they come here to open the estate. That person lived in Baltimore City. so. Um, we do try to give um, uh, over the phone, make sure people are going in the right place. But the first question is, was the person domiciled here? Second is, that, did they have a will? And obviously, if they were domiciled and they had a will, um, we'll want to see that. And then, most importantly also, um, did they have any assets in their own name? And if so, um, we will walk through sort of um, your options for uh, getting values for those things. We are. My attitude is I'm very flexible about what you provide us with. Um, so the most recent bank statements for bank accounts, um, for uh, tangible personal properties, stuff that's in your house, um, I don't think of you having to, I, we don't require that you account for every single thing that's in someone's home. What I think about are anything worth appraising. So maybe valuable furniture, jewelry, things like that, um, but not you know clothing or um, you know, dishes or anything like that. Um, nine times out of ten, I, probably more than that. Um, family just sort of um, deals with all of that on their own without uh, any kind of supervision. Um, for car values, um, we use um, uh, NADA or Kelly Blue Book is fine. For property, you can either use the tax assessment value or you can get an appraisal. So if you feel like the tax assessment value is way off from the value you can have an appraisal done. And this is the, so if you, if you called my office tomorrow and you wanted to, um, and you said that um, someone had passed away, this is the list that we would give you. Um, we, we need to see the will if there is one. We need proof of death, obviously, to open an estate. Um, funeral bill, if there was any. Date of death value for any assets and debts. Um, title to cars, if there are any. Names and addresses of interested persons. When we open an estate, um, notice is given to the interested persons in the estate. Interested persons are everyone named in the will and everyone who would inherit if there is no will. So, um, and again, we only sort of go out to where there's sort of the nearest relative living. This is not an exhaustive family tree or something. So, you know, let's just take a, a very simple case where um, uh, husband dies, wife survives. Husband's will leaves everything to the wife. If there are children, um, they would have inherited if there were no will. So notice would be given to the wife because she inherits in the will, um, and children because they would have gotten, they would have inherited if there were no will. Um, so um, we need to get all that information from everyone. Um, in some estates, we need a bond. Um, and this is because the person representative is a fiduciary. Um, one of the great benefits to your will is that you can waive the necessity of getting a personal representative bond. Um, without a waiver of bond provision in the will, your personal representative has to get a bond for the full value of the estate, which can be very expensive. So if you have a, let's just say a $500,000 estate, which is easy to get to if you have a house in the estate, um, in Howard County anyway, um, that bond can be a couple thousand dollars and you have to renew it every year. With the waiver of bond, the only thing that you'll, the PR will have to get is a nominal bond, which will cost about $100 and that covers um, fees to my office, any inheritance taxes if there are any, and uh, claims against the estate, so debts. Um, so that's, and that's a state requirement. Um, yes, sir? So um, your estate will be comprised of um, whatever probate assets you have when you pass away, and the will will govern what happens to them. 
Okay. So continuing care retirement facilities. Yeah. That's a that's a really good question. So continuing care facilities. Actually, so my grandmother was at Charlestown, and so we had to deal with that issue specifically. It was a nightmare. <laughs> it was a complete nightmare. Um, sure. So at those kinds of facilities, someone makes a deposit when they move in, um, and you, it, it is important to name beneficiaries on that. Um, and I think, I, I know when my grandparents moved in, they didn't do that, and it wasn't like pushed on them. So it was later on that I think we encouraged them to make sure that was all in order. But you are completely, like, they are completely in the driver's seat. So they, um, you've gotta wait until they, any final payments are taken out of that, and. Um, they renovate the apartment and everything, so it might be a very long time. Yes? Sure. So, um, and th this is a little complicated to understand, but this is, uh, Maryland law requires that for um, any solvent estate, so what that means is um, any estate where um, when, we, when I showed you that list and there were um, a couple of um, allowances for funeral allowance, family allowance, um, if after those allowances are paid out or there were no funeral expenses, um, there is any value left in the estate, they have to be bonded. And even if you have a waiver of bond provision in the will, you still have to get a nominal bond. And again, it's, it's like $100, it lasts for the entire life of the estate, and it covers fees to my office, inheritance taxes, and any claims from creditors. Okay. So that's that's the deal with the nominal bond. Okay. Um, we have. Uh, we talked, if you go to the third bullet there, uh, will of no estate we already talked about. So that's when a person passed away, they have a will, but no probate assets. So there's no estate that has to be opened. We'll still take the will on file, um, no fee. Um, the other two types of estates we have are small estates and regular estates. Small estates are valued up to $50,000. It is a really simple process. For a lot of these estates, <clears throat> my goal, and this is why I always encourage people to call our office first, my goal is that you only have to come to the, my office one time. Um, if you come and you bring all the uh, documentation that you need, the names and addresses of the interested persons, if we have all the information about the value of your assets, um, we will issue what are called letters of administration. Um, some, in some places they're called uh, testamentary letters. Um, it's a very official looking document that has a raised seal on it. That is what the PR will take to the bank, the MBA, wherever. Uh, to take um, to transact business on behalf of the decedent, um, so we try to get all of that to you in one visit. Um, regular estates are over fifty thousand um, dollars. A more formal accounting is required. Um, you've got to file um, sort of an estimate of the value of everything at the beginning, and then you have a couple of months to file a more detailed inventory of the assets. The accounts that are due periodically in those larger estates do go before the orphans court. Um, um, and they usually sort of sign off on them after my auditors have looked at them. Um, about two-thirds of the estates in Howard County are small estates. Um, so the vast majority of estates go through a much simpler administrative process, and that's, I think, for a couple of reasons. Um, I think because we're in Howard County, lots of people have the ability to plan, um, so there isn't a whole lot left um, that hasn't been uh, titled properly or put in trust. <coughs> Also, people are living a lot longer, so people are, frankly, passing away with a lot less um, at the end. Um, and, uh, but again, the benefit is sort of that it's a, it's a streamlined process, it's really easy. Um, and that's, those are the kinds of estates where we have like a bank account, a car. Um, the regular estates usually have property involved. Oh, right. So this on the right here is the, um, 
letter of administration that I was talking about. Um, and on the left is an administrative probate order. So when we open an estate, those are the things that the PR gets. So the, one, the document on the left formally admits the uh, will to probate, formally appoints someone as PR, and the right will give you a number of copies of that document that you can take to take care of um, the assets. All right, so fees and taxes. <clears throat> um, need to update this at the beginning of next year um, because the federal estate tax exemption is now going up to, I think, $11 million. Um, what's important here is that there is a federal estate tax and a Maryland estate tax that deals with all of your assets. So that is everything. So when I talk about your will governing your probate assets, so um, assets that are in your name alone or don't have a beneficiary, um, the Maryland estate tax and the federal estate tax, that's dealing with your entire estate, all of your assets that you can think of, okay? And we don't deal with that. Um, the federal estate tax is dealt with by the IRS. The comptroller's office in Maryland deals with the Maryland estate tax. Maryland is one of a couple of states that has an inheritance tax. The estate tax is based on the gross value of everything you own, okay? The inheritance tax is not based on, on how much money there is. It's based on the relationship of who is inheriting. So um, we have lots of estates where there is no estate tax, but there is an inheritance tax, or vice versa. Um, most family members are exempt from the inheritance tax. So if you haven't heard of it, that's probably why, um, is that um, spouses, siblings, children, grandchildren, stepchildren, parents are all exempt from the inheritance tax. So the only people who pay it are nieces and nephews, cousins, or people who have no blood relationship to you. So if I were to pass away and I left money to my nieces and nephews, um, nieces and nephew, um, there would be a 10% inheritance tax they would pay, okay? Um, if I left it to my mother, it would be tax exempt. The overwhelming majority of our estates do not pay inheritance tax. Um, so um, if you are in a situation where um, you want to leave something to who would be taxable heirs. So, uh, I mean, I'll use myself as an example. I don't have any children, but I've got a nephew and two nieces. Um, the way that I would plan for them is um, gifting during your lifetime uh, before you pass away or um, life insurance, which is completely exempt from the uh, inheritance tax. Um, so that's an easy way to plan around that. Um, something people usually do in their will also is there will be a tax clause. Uh, that will allow the PR to pay out of the estate any taxes or fees that anyone had to pay as a result of inheriting something from you. Um, so for example, if I wanted to leave, um, if I wanted to leave um, $10,000 to my nephew um, and not have him pay the tax, I would have a provision in my will that would say the estate would pay the tax instead of the person inheriting. Yes. Hold on one second, let's get you a, let me get a microphone here. If what the person's gonna inherit is like a, say a ring, um, will that have to be valued, assessed, and okay? Yeah, so if, if you have jewelry or something tangible, you have to get some sort of appraisal done for that. And if they're a taxable heir, that's, that's a great example of actually when having a tax clause in your will be really important um, because you don't want to say, you know, I leave you this diamond ring that's valued at $10,000 um, and you've got to find $1,000 to pay this tax um, or if it's an antique car or something like that. So that's again why the um, uh, tax provision is so important. Um, and this is a breakdown, yes, sir, question up here. Why would you admit to having jewelry? <laughs> why would you tell anybody that? <laughs> uh, why would you tell anyone? I'm sure there's lots of stuff that we don't know about. Um, the, you, the one thing I'll say is that everything that you sign, all these forms that we have, you sign all of them under the penalties of perjury. So when you, when you say these are all the assets and if you leave something off, you know, um, that's just the one disclaimer I'll give you. So I'm sure there's lots of stuff that we don't know about though. I'll add to that. The, um, but it's okay if you give that jewelry away before you die. Correct. 
So can, there's an can, advantage yeah. to that. Yeah, you can make gifts before you pass away to avoid all that. Yes. Correct. So the question is, if you left jewelry to a child, would they have to pay a tax? The answer is no. So the inheritance tax, again, children, grandchildren, stepchildren are exempt, uh, siblings, spouses, parents, grandparents. And I know, I, I know we're sort of, um, we're out of time here, but I'm, I, I will hang around and answer questions as long as you have them. Are PODs taxable? You know, when you have a POD from a tax, you know, like a um, CD or whatever, is so, that taxable? Um, so we do, there is one form that we have, it's called our information report, where we ask that you report non-probate assets, <coughs> excuse me. So these are assets that are jointly held or have a payable and death designation, but they're taxable. We're not concerned with stuff that isn't taxable, so if you have a house with a spouse or you have a payable and death account to a son or a daughter, that's not going to be reported, but um, if you have any non-probate transfers that are going to taxable heirs, that gets reported on the information report. So we would want to know about that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um. And I'll just say that, you know, there are lots of, I'm sure that there are, the, the taxes that we collect if, if it's even 1% of taxable transfers that happen in Maryland, I'd be surprised um, because um, we, real, we typically only know about it if there's a probate estate. So if someone passes away and they never had to open an estate because everything was payable in death, jointly held, or in trust, we're probably not going to hear about it. And I'm not encouraging you to do that. I'm just saying we're not going to hear about it typically. Um, if you're leaving something to someone in another state, do the Maryland laws supersede the other state? Or? Yeah, so when you um, pass away in Maryland, everything related to, the, to dealing with your estate will follow Maryland law. Uh, if I and my brother are joint owners of a piece of property in another state, how should I handle that in my will? Um, how would you handle jointly held property in another state? Yes. If, if you pass away, by operation of law, that property becomes entirely his. So if you make reference to it in your will, it won't have any effect because it's jointly held. Now if, you, and now, if you own it, if you're 50, like if you're 50, 50 owners, then you should talk about it. Because that, the, your, the three different tenancies we have, we have tenancy by the entireties, which is a joint tenancy for married couples, joint tenancy, which always has a right of survivorship, and tenants in common. So if you're 50, 50 owners, so you don't own it jointly, you, own it, you each own 50% of it, um, you, um, you should talk about that in your will, because your 50% interest will be uh, a probate asset. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, if you have questions, he did say he's willing to stay afterwards and answer questions. Good advice. Okay, thank you all very much.